You're listening to the Soil Sisters podcast, where we dig in on family farming and ranching, regenerative agriculture, healthy living, and planting seeds in our community. We invite you to listen, subscribe, and grow with the Soil Sisters. All right. Here we are. Well, folks, I am here alone in the studio. My soil sister, Joanna, is on location in Wichita Falls, Texas. So we're going to give her a quick call and catch up with her and see what she's been doing today. She's been at a hemp opening for the Panda Biotech that we have contracted with for our hemp in Stonewall County. So she's been there checking in with them, and I'm excited to hear what she's got to say. So let's see what happens. Hello, sister. All right. There you are. Hi, Joanna. Calling in to the Texas Soil Sister Show. How's it going? Great. I have had a busy day in Wichita Falls, Texas. The Panda Biotech Hemp Gen brand opening. It was awesome. Well, I love it. Tell me what happened. Yeah. Well, first of all, I have to say thank you for driving the bus today. This is, <laughs> it's fun to be in the passenger seat. Well, my heart is pounding, but I think it's all going to be okay. <laughs> yes, it's going to be great. You're fabulous. Um, so, yeah, I went to the, the opening of the Hemp Gin, and, you know, I've talked about this before, but to just, you know, give people an idea of the the expansiveness of it all. Tens of millions of dollars have been invested in building this first hemp gin um, for Panda Biotech. And it's located on 97 acres in Wichita Falls um, with a 500,000 square foot production facility. And it is the largest facility, hemp processing facility in the Americas and the second largest in the world which is a really big deal for our state. And um, when this thing is going at capacity, it's going to be able to process 2.9 metric tons of feedstock per hour, sister. Wow. Yeah, totally insane. And the gin is operational. They, They cranked things up about three months ago. And so they're already um, processing. I'm bringing back for you some show and tell. I still have um, some of the micronized hemp pellets that they're creating and Yay. some of the mechanically cottonized hemp fiber. So we'll have show and tell for anybody who wants to see it, um, what's going on. But I had a lot of really great conversations um, with farmers and, you know, some of the people that are stakeholders in the operation, the Panda Biotech facility. I mean, all of this stuff was started by the Carter family. And I mean, their half of their family is involved in making this thing a reality, which is really cool to see. Um, but their financial partner is the Southern Ute Indian tribe out of Colorado. Wow. And so, there are a lot of people there today representing that tribal nation and Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller was there. He spoke. The president of Panda Biotech is Dixie Carter. She's the daughter of the man who conceptualized all this and wanted to make it happen. And so um, it wasn't just a traditional ribbon cutting either, sister. It was a hemp denim ribbon cutting. Oh so that was pretty cute. Yeah. So they handed out hemp bags to everyone, you know, they made the hemp denim sash, you know, to just showcase what all's happening. Well, I hope um, you got me a bag because you know my canvas bag is seen better days. Well, maybe <laughs> I will just give you mine because I only got one, but I'm, I'm happy to share. You know, Excellent. I've got a thousand of them. <laughs> but yeah, so people that are interested in knowing, you know, what all is coming out of this hemp gin. You know, they've got three outputs and literally there's zero waste, which is a lot of fun to think about. You know, like I said, the mechanically cottonized hemp fiber and they are contracting, you know, people like us to grow it. And then they've already set up contracts with manufacturers for that cottonized hemp fiber. And then they create these hemp pellets. You know, all the dust that gets sucked off of the operation gets pulled into a separate facility, you know, on another part of the 
campus and it gets pelletized and they are, you know, using that for bioplastics. It's being used for animal feed, which I don't know how I feel about that, but. Well, I want to know about mulch. What are they using for mulch? Are they using any of that? Well, that would probably be the herd. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the hemp herd is the core of the stem, you know, that, and then the fibers are around it, but that, that herd gets bagged and, you know, is used as animal bedding. It can be mm, used yeah. as a construction material, but I think it'd be a darn good mulch. Yeah, absolutely. More organic material so, for our soil. And speaking of, I sat next to a guy who his family, they don't own acreage, but they lease 12,000 acres. And they dry land farm 12,000 acres in North Texas. Wow. And they're still using all the commercial inputs, but he's no-till. He's been no-till for almost eight years. He's like, if you're dry farming, you have to no-till. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. He's going to be a great one to talk to. We'll have him on the podcast. His name's Kenneth McAllister. He was just saying that since they've been no-till, even though they are using these commercial inputs, right. they need far less of them because they're keeping roots in the soil year round. And the microbes are staying in there because they can handle it. The bacteria, the fungi can break down those toxins, but you can't keep tilling up the soil. That's what kills them and lets all the weeds loose. Well, and it also just helps keep the, the temperature down, yeah. which, you know, as we ended up seeing with our temp crop in Lockhart, you know, when it got super stressed getting all of that rain and, you know, they don't like wet feet, as yeah. people like to call it. Um, you know, they were stressed out in the ground, but then also it's 95 to 100 degrees and they just didn't know how to handle it. And they started flowering early. So having those roots in the soil and being able to control as much as possible the temperature um, by, you know, having stuff that's shading the ground, covering it, roots in the soil, all that is going to make a huge difference for people to have, you know, successful hemp crops right now while we're still in this transition phase of not having a Texas hemp seed variety. Absolutely. And Dion and I actually went out there earlier today, and it is all around the edges. It's growing around the edges where there was... Um, some kind of cover on the soil. There was more uh, plant life, organic matter, and out in the middle, nothing. So, yeah, just proves our did point. Did you, when y'all were inspecting today, did you see any more that were flowering or are they just growing? Yes. Some flowering, some growing, but there were a few that had flowered. I'll be curious to see when we get, when we get home to the ranch in a couple of weeks. Ooh, you're going to be very excited. Yeah. So, I ran into, uh, the agronomist for Panda and um, was asking him about the THC testing that we have to do. And he is certified to come out and take the samples. And so I told him I would reach out to him so that we could set something up maybe in that four or five day window when we're at the ranch so that he can come out, check out the crop and he'll take the plant sample and then he will send it off. Panda's going to send it off to um, SD Labs, which I was pleasantly surprised to hear because I was asking him which testing lab that they recommended. And he was just like, we're going to handle all that for you. But SC Labs is one of the labs that I worked with when I was working in the California cannabis industry. They're a highly respected lab and they know their stuff. So I was happy to hear that they're you know, they're interfacing in the hemp space as well. Perfect. So anyway, that. we'll get that on the book and then be able to help other people better understand what this whole THC testing process is like for us growing industrial. Yeah, that is, that's good information because I don't really understand why we have to do that. If we're going to use it for fiber, fabric, building materials, plastics, but I'm uh, interested to learn. So that's great. Well, and a lot of that is just the red tape of the farm bill and 
the people creating it not understanding the difference between medical and industrial. Right. I mean, because if it if it's over the you know point three percent THC, they say, well, you have to destroy it. Well, <laughs> okay, we're going to throw it into a giant machine and pulverize it. Like, exactly. isn't that destroying it? Yes, perfect. Happy to do it. So, right, exactly. So I don't. I think this Yuma hemp seed that we got that's, you know, the Chinese-based seed, I think they've pretty much bred the THC out of it. So I will be right. very curious what that ends up looking like. But, you know, it could end up being that for our climate, that may be the better seed. You know, we were trying two different ones, right. two different climates, two different soil types. But this Italian seed that we used in Lockhart, seems pretty uh sensey sensey yeah <laughs> um but you know what i'm telling you it was just walking around there today i it is so clear to me i wish we had just crimped and planted into that ground because that's exactly what happened on those turn rows and it's coming up and better than it was in the middle so lesson learned and good information for next time well, yeah, don't they say hindsight's twenty twenty? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm nearly going blind. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, okay, so the other exciting news that I heard today, so I was talking to Serge, the VP of Ag for Panda Biotech, and I was talking to him about the Johnson Grass situation and that I had been talking to other processors about whether or not that might have any effect um, at harvest. And he said that they have received um, a couple of different feedstock shipments from farmers that had quite a bit of wheat in it or some other grasses. And so they're about to do an experiment and process this stuff and see if there's any difference. They seem to think that like this wheat that's in these certain bales from this one particular farmer that a lot of that stuff will just get pulverized and dusted. Therefore, you know, it'll get sucked out of the operation and go into the micronized hemp pellet. Mm -hmm. So it could be that that doesn't have to be any big deal and just something we've worried about over nothing. So, um, I like that. Yes. So <laughs> stay tuned. Yeah, for that. But there were so many first time hemp farmers there. Yay. That I talked to that had to replant just like us. Okay. So, and one of them being, I mean, there were some that had, you know, a couple of hundred acres. The Wagner Ranch is growing 2,800 acres. Wow. Which is the largest hemp grow in the United States, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think they even had to do a replant. I don't know if it was on all of it or, but, or on part of it, but... Um, there were a lot of people that had those same issues due to the unusually heavy rains that we had. And then, you know, some people have that kind of like a sugary sand kind of soil where high winds were responsible for, you know, blowing out wow. their first seed. So anyway, I felt a lot better <sighs> about our situation after talking to other farmers, which, of course, isn't that always the case. <laughs> Yes, it is. Thank you for telling me that. That makes me feel better as well. Yes. Mm. Oh, my gosh. And on my drive, I saw so much farmland underwater. It just made me sick. Oh, gosh. And just seeing these round bales that are just in a field that are, you know, the bottom foot of it is underwater. Wow. It's just so much work down the drains for a lot of these farmers around here. Well, always uh, on the upside make compost. <laughs> I mean, really, yeah. because that's what we need in this heavy clay soil. That's what we need in that sandy loam with a lot of jip in it was organic material. And if we had that spread across the ground when those seeds were planted, then that would have given it the protection that it needed when the rains came or when the wind comes and, you know, to keep it cooler, like you said earlier. So yeah, that's just a good idea. Well, and I would like for us to be able to just cover all of that acreage. So I'm, exci I'm excited to talk 
um, to Daddy when we get home about what it would look like to get all of that farmland in our name so that we can start this transition process. But we we need to get that mulch done on that sandy road that goes down to the yeah. hemp field anyway, because mm-hmm. when we harvest, we've got to be able to get that stuff out of there. Yeah. You and Kat had a meeting yesterday about these grants and stuff. Anything exciting to report to me? Well, actually, there's lots of exciting things to report, and we will talk about that just on the other side of our underwriting announcement. Stay tuned. All right. You are listening to the Texas Soil Sisters Radio Hour on KLKT in Lockhart, Texas. So, Joanna, our meeting with Kat yesterday. Yes. Tell me more. Well, you know what? First of all, we just started getting organized, and that was so exciting. She's found an app, a research app, that we can put all of our grants and all of the information that we you know, projects that we're working on and different tasks in, and they can be assigned to different people. And so anyway, we nerded out for like two hours over this app. It's called Notion, I believe. So okay. anyway, we're excited about that. That's the thing that we got in the email. So sign up for that and you can get in there and see what we've done. We've just been adding um, information and all the stuff that we're going to need for these grants. And also we've started adding in our farmers, because we're looking for 10 to 20 farmers for our conservation innovation grant. Um, So anyway, starting to fill in those names and that information. So it's getting very exciting. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Because I talked to a few people today about it. So that'll be great to start getting that information in there and, and the types of farmers they are. I would like to have farmers all over the state, you know, different ages, walks of life, different yeah. soil types, so that we can do these on-farm trials and create a blueprint for growing hemp in the state. I love it. Yes. What else did y'all talk about or work on? Well, really, we just... Is there any homework that I have? <laughs> getting in there, get in there and just look and see and add more stuff. And that's the whole thing. We just get the grants, each individual grant in, and then kind of figure out what the timeline is and the tasks that we need to do. So that's just going to be your homework. It's getting in there and seeing what we're doing and also figuring out how to best use the program. So we benefit the most from it. So that's the homework. All right. It's so important to have somebody that's as organized as Kat is when you're doing this stuff. I feel like I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off half the time, just trying to get all the little tasks done. And so to, I really appreciate her doing that for us. I do too. And this goes back to the whole community aspect of this. Like I couldn't do this by myself. You couldn't do this by yourself and we can't do it by ourselves. So the people that are showing up and, and getting interested and getting involved are, are infinitely, oh my gosh, important. And it's so exciting, but we really did. We just had such a good time being excited about what we're going to do. So that was what a lot of our time was organizing and being giddy about nerdy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, the fact that $3 billion was set aside in the Inflation Reduction Act for agriculture, yeah. it is, and the fact that they are saying there are not enough people applying for this money, yeah, it's just like, why not? Like When we're looking around. We, yeah, and seeing people mm. all in our community that could benefit from support. So, yeah, I'm really happy to be doing this. Speaking of support, so the guy that I was telling you about earlier that leases 12,000 acres That's of insane. land. That's insane. Well, so, okay, so how they do it. His dad, 80-year-old dad, him and his three sons, mm-hmm. they each have a farm number. And so they each are responsible for different plots. They also have two hands um, that help them. But between all of them, they basically work like a co-op where they are all helping each other, but they each have a specific farm that, that they focus on. Okay. And, 
Yeah. So, because when I was just like, what? You have 12,000 acres of farmland? That scared me. (laughs) And he was like, I don't own it. And this goes back to the conversation that I was having with the VP of the Central Texas uh, Young Farmers Coalition about the need for matchmaking between landowners and farmers and, you know, land stewards. Because there's so much land in this state that is gets bought up by, you know, rich folks that want to have a place to go hunt or, you know, want to have a place to maybe retire. And they're sitting on 100, 200, 300 acres yeah. and they're not doing anything with it. Mm-hmm. And Texas farming and ranching is at a crisis point right now. I mean, 2% of the population creates food for everyone else. Yeah. And we're losing you know, our farmers are aging out and we have people that are buying land that aren't doing anything with it. And so being vocal, creating these kinds of opportunities is, I mean, I feel like it's urgent. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll tell you the idea I had last night. I was just kind of thinking about how so many people say, well, I know we can't grow enough food organically to feed the world, which I say, whatever, dude, we can do that. And if we had every county, if we went by county and said, okay, how many people do we have in this county? How much meat do we need? How much beef? How much pork? How much chicken? Lamb, goat, all discover how many people we have, how much we need. And then really like Florida advertises for us to come vacation with them. Why wouldn't we say, Hey, Caldwell County needs a milk cow operation or Caldwell County needs a ranching operation and and offer as a county. And this is what all counties across the country could do is really like, who? what do we need to take care of our community? If we stepped out of this mass production of things, which it's not even like we're, we have to step out because half the time we're being scared into the fact that it's just going to go away anyway. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to feed ourselves in our community. And if we did that and had each individual community or county, really the people, the leaders of that community thinking about their own constituents and how we can get these people fed and just teaching the community to feed themselves and how backyard gardens could really be such a benefit where everybody grows something different. We all share together. So there's so many ways to support humanity right now through all the stuff that's happening. We just have to take a deep breath and relax and let our mind think about what the most collectively supportive thing might be. And that just really got me excited last night. Yeah, certainly. And being able to diversify what the counties are offering. Some of the people that are starting the direct to consumer model with, you know, protein, um, the few that I've been talking to, you know, their cattle operations, and they immediately see the boost in their revenue by obviously cutting out the middleman. And I mean, it's so hard to be able to produce enough. It's a, a long runway to get to that point. Yeah. And so you don't have to have some huge marketing effort. You don't have to know a lot about that stuff if you are a farmer or rancher and that you want to do the direct to consumer because there are enough people now, in my opinion, that are interested in eating healthy, understanding more about the importance of regenerative agriculture and supporting their local farmers that anybody that just decided to do it, that I believe they would be sold out immediately Absolutely. of anything they have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all the destruction of animals that we're hearing about across the country, it's like, what? why would you worry about that if you could find a local producer? that would be more than capable of feeding you and your family nutritious and nutrient dense food that was loved and cared for. So yeah, I think it is a no brainer. Well, knowing farmers and ranchers and asking them, what do you need? Yeah. How can we help you? For example, let's, I mean, this hemp, fortunately we were in a situation where we participated in Panda Biotech's pay to grow program 
So, you know, the $16,000 worth of hemp seed that we planted the first time, we didn't have to pay for it. Yeah. And then we have a torrential downpour two days later. A couple of weeks later, we're having to replant. Well, we didn't have to go out and buy $16,000 worth of seed a second time. We got it again for free. And I don't know any farmers <laughs> that just have $32,000 to, you know, flush down the toilet. Yeah, no. So being able to know seek out your farmers and ranchers and, you know, asking them how their year's going, what's happening. And I feel like farmers, that's the ultimate service industry. Yeah. Why are we not tipping our farmers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and just like going so, to these stack meetings like that we've gone to with the NRCS, um, they're asking what people need. So it seems to me this may be part of that. Well, and it's also funny to see how easy it is to make your voice heard at those kind of meetings because not enough people show up to them. Yep. So you and I just being curious and interested show up at these meetings and, you know, participate in subcommittees and, you know, be able to have some sort of a voice or influence. And, you know, even if I get it, not every farmer can stop what they're doing and drive to Temple, Texas for a meeting, but you can certainly communicate with the farmers in your area and send one representative out and just make sure that your voice is being heard, your needs are getting met. And, you know, frankly, that's why we're doing this grant application for, you know, these on-farm trials with hemp, because this is something that Ag Commissioner Sid Miller is saying this is a priority for the state of Texas. Well, nobody in the state of Texas has grown this stuff. We're all, everybody's first time farming, figuring it out. When they say it grows like a weed and it's easy, it's not that easy. Okay? It's it's not. It, yeah. There's some finesse. There's licensing. There's questionable whether or not you can have crop insurance. There's just a lot of unknowns. And... To be able to showcase that, okay, the state is looking for this. We have a state-of-the-art facility, the largest one in the Americas, in our relative backyard. We need to figure out how to subsidize farmers to grow hemp. But until we have these on-farm trials, that can't happen. So we're playing the long game sister. We're playing the very long game. Absolutely. It's the only game to play, truly, as far as I'm concerned. That's true. (sighs) This is true. I love using the, uh, you're playing checkers and life's a game of chess. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's what we're doing with this, with the hemp, is what needs to happen is we need to remediate our soil. We need to put life back into the soil. And that, I mean, it can happen a lot quicker than most people think because we've kind of been sold a bill of goods about how hard things are and how long it takes. And this all comes from people who make a lot of money for it to be real hard and take a long time. So it's just, we have to figure out how to do this so that we can share this information and make it easier for people to make it easier for themselves. So, yeah. And I will just go ahead and plug while we're sitting here, the U.S. Domestic Hemp Production Program. If you want more information on that, you can go to ams.usda.gov, and that will give you the overview of what the program is, what the licensing needs are, how to get into the system to do that legally. So um, that I want to throw out there. And then also for anyone interested in learning more about what Panda Biotech is doing, you can visit pandabiotech.com for more information. Perfect. Perfect. And like Joanna was saying earlier, it is such a fabulous program. I can't even believe how blessed we are to have gotten involved with that. And, you know, that family, uh, the Carter family who started Panda Biotech, their family ranch was um, in Seymour. So them landing at this facility in Wichita Falls, it's 
just kind of like their backyard. They're coming home, so to speak. And this facility used to be a, a GM plant where they made catalytic converters. So this building, you know, this huge thing, it's like the walls are 20 inches thick. I mean, it's nuts. It's like a tornado proof building, you know, Wichita Falls being tornado alley. <laughs> but Good it idea. also has rail access. Oh, yeah. So Perfect. right now, you know, we have to be within, was it 180 mile radius, 150 mile radius for, for Panda to handle the logistics mm -hmm. of moving your feedstock, something like that. Well, when the rail access is live, they'll be able to work with a lot more farmers in, you know, a lot larger footprint. So, awesome. um, you know, where we are in Caldwell County, you know, I feel like once the rail is live for them that, you know, more farmers in our area would be able to get involved. Excellent. So I was doing some research in the past couple of days, just more about the phytoremediation of our soil by plants. Phytoremediation is that's plants taking this toxicity out of the soil. And so it is just, it's so amazing and super exciting. And I've really been getting in the weeds on this and I'm trying to figure out how to no say pun it intended. <laughs> in an elementary sort of a way so that people who don't really know or care about this might understand and get involved because that really is, if we could just stop using the chemical pesticides and herbicides and, and, nitrogen fertilizers that we've been using that go so far in healing our land and healing the soil's gut, putting the microbes back in the soil. And when that happens, they're in the plant. And when that happens, they're in the animal that eats them or in the human that eats them. And so we're, we're building health from the soil up. And I really, really love that part of the hemp plant that takes care of that, that helps pull those heavy metals out of our soils. Yes, it's a circle of life. Yeah, it is. And that's and hemp is so good at soil remediation, pulling the heavy metals and toxins out of the soil, and then doing rotational planting, you know, being able to just rotate through your entire operation, putting hemp at different times on that, and then, you know, Seeing the difference that if you then put cotton on that the next year or you do a wheat or a hay grazer, mm -hmm. like what do you see the difference? You know, I think we're just in a an exciting phase of experimentation right now. And it's fun to see Texas farmers and ranchers getting it yeah. and understanding. Like one man today said, farming in the 80s was fun. <laughs> He's like, farming is not fun anymore. I do not enjoy farming. This is, it's stressful. And especially when you're, when you're dry land farming, you know, you have to have a plan and then you have to let go and let God. Yeah, you know? totally. <laughs> because it's, you can only do so much. Yes. Well, um, I want to hear more if that guy told you why it was fun to farm in the eighties, but I want to do that right after we hear an underwriting announcement. All right. You got it. So Joanna, tell me why that guy enjoyed farming in the 80s? <laughs> well, he says back then he was able to spend the majority of his time farming, very little time doing paperwork, and he had stellar cotton crops and just things were easier. Now, it's because the soil is completely depleted now. Yeah. And the amount of money that has to be spent on inputs to get to where they need to be, it's stressful. He said he spends more time doing office paperwork stuff than he ever has before. And that you're not getting ahead. You're not making money. He said this one particular year, I think he said 1992, um, he had this amazing crop. He said, I paid every bill. I owed at the end of that harvest, I was flush. I, I had money in the bank and he was like, we haven't since. And what year was that? I think he said 92. Whoa. Whoa. And you know, I mean, that paces with 
the conversations we have with our family about how long it's been since it was a profitable operation. Right. And, you know, it's the definition of insanity. Yeah. Why? How are people going to continue to do the same thing over and over and over until they don't even have a farm left to turn over to their children or the next generation? And so this one particular farmer brought his buddy who he works on the Wagner Ranch. And he's just, this guy's like, all right, like, I hear y'all, you're talking regen ag. Now I'm just going to hide and watch. And, you know, the thing is, again, it's the long game. It's we're looking at our fields right now and they don't look pristine. They don't look completely uniform. It's a little more ragtag, but you have to start somewhere. Like yes. the change, the, you know, that first workout you do after <laughs> you haven't worked out forever, you know, you're going to wake up it's the painful. next couple of days and have trouble sitting down on a toilet and it's going to take you a while to like build up that muscle memory and get it going again. Yeah. Our stuff right now, I recognize it doesn't look great, but it's going to get better. And you know, in three, four five years, it's going to be totally different. It will be transformed. Well, and if we get that land under our farm number and we can use the organic transition initiative and begin to get support to put some of that organic material onto the soil, then that is going to take us a long way in a very short amount of time. Yeah, a hundred percent it will. I'm going to visit a farmer tomorrow. He grows some sort of hay and he used no commercial fertilizer in 2023 on 30 acres. He went cold turkey. I'm like, you're the first other person that I know that's done that. <laughs> nice. Um, and he put that money into the biology and seed. Yes. And so he worked with Dan at Fed and Happy, and he had a 50% cost savings. And he did a cover crop mix and focused his money in, in the biology and he attracted these registered longhorn breeders as clients and they noticed the difference. So they've got cattle, they've got registered longhorns here in Texas. They also have registered longhorns in New Mexico. And they noticed the difference in their cattle eating Bob's hay versus the ones in on their New Mexico property that were being fed corn and hay and a different mix of things. They could tell a difference in their coat, their overall health, the way they look, and they won a bunch of awards with their Texas Longhorns, and so now they are buying Bob's hay, and they are hauling it to New Mexico to feed their their Longhorns there. Nice. So I'm excited to check out his operation. He did say that This year, he did use a little bit of uh, nitrogen. He said, you know, the plants were looking a little anemic. And so he did use a little bit of fertilizer, but not much. Yeah. And so I'm excited to see, see his operation. But he said he's getting things to grow in an area where things wouldn't grow before because he bought a no-till seed drill. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Interesting. I know. I love that this just keeps coming back. I know it. I know it. It's so fun. So fun. And I also, in a book that I've just been reading, and she says, if you're going to use a fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, to just add a bit of humates to it, and just to support your microbiology so that you're not frying them down there and that, you know, it can be done if it needs to be done. And that's, you know, we're not trying to break anyone or, you know, totally turn everything upside down. We do what we can do. We do the best we can. And just by adding some humates in with our our nitrogen fertilizer, that's going to help keep your soil from being degraded by that chemical fertilizer. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll ask Bob if he knows about that when, I'm, when I see him tomorrow. Ooh, yes. Okay. For the love of soil. And what's her name? That's the book. Nicole Masters. Yes. For the low oh, of soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a good book. It is such a good book. We're going to have a Soil Sisters book club for any people who are interested in learning more about this and being able to sit down and have a book in their hands and just 
read the information and try to absorb it because sometimes just hearing it doesn't always do it. So stay tuned for that because that's going to be super fun. But the book that I'm talking about is For the Love of Soil by Nicole Masters. So check that out at the library or wherever you get your books. Have you heard anything about the Roots So Deep documentary? I have, and I want to see it, but I have not seen it yet. Maybe we can watch it together. Yeah, I don't know what network it's playing on, but you know, I just have this running list of things that people recommend to me, and mm-hmm. that is on that list. It may be on their own website. I don't know that... I saw what I saw was a link to their own website rather than it being on a platform. Oh, okay. So we'll see. I have to look that up. Well, and the trailer that I saw for it, these are older ranch families and they, you know, they're neighbors. And one of the couples has adopted the region model. The other is sticking to what they know Mm -hmm. and just seeing how the land is changing, how, other farmers in the community are getting curious. They're like, oh, I haven't been on their land, but I can see it from the highway and things are looking good and people get curious what's going on. And, you know, I think that if you don't see, you know, a Root So Deep documentary or you're not actively seeking solutions, you, you know, your eyes, it's when they're like, oh, okay, that land is looking way different than it did before. Mm-hmm. What are they doing? Yeah. And, you know, that's what I hope we get to, you know, out at the ranch is being able to be a show and tell ranch of how to transition from big ag, you know, the commercial farming model to one of, you know, regeneration. Yes. We ha- we're in good company. There's a, there are a lot of people in this state that are waking up and, and I'm very hopeful. So that's exciting. Well, I love it. And I'm hopeful, too, because I know. And if we can get daddy excited about this <laughs> and all the old farmers that he's talking to, you know, that, that's fun. That's exciting. We are we are making change and that um, it's been a time coming. But I, I have patience. It's going to be good. Well, and you know, when you were talking earlier about getting communities involved and having you know, different operations growing and breeding different things. One of the the things that we've talked about are high dollar commodity cover crops. Like we, we need roots in the soil, but what are things that we can do that can actually turn a profit? Yeah. Because we have to utilize as much of the land as possible and diversify these streams of income. And so I will be curious to do a little bit more research on good commodity cover crops like, you know, for example, the sesame that we've talked about. You know, it's one of the best pollinator attractors and it is high value and, you know, flax. And so finding out what some of these Mm -hmm. things are that might work well in, in Texas, I'm excited to do more homework on that. And then also to just make friends with the mesquite, man, figure out how people can monetize the mesquite on their land and you know that's another great one for for these grants Mm -hmm. you know this is a considered a culturally significant plant i would think yes um and so just through the conservation stewardship program exploring different ancient grains and and mesquite and it doesn't have to look the same farming does not have to look the same here as it has for the last 50 years yeah and being able to diversify operations, go direct to consumer, being able to create an opportunity for folks to be local whores. Yeah. Like, I don't need to go anywhere else. Everything yeah. I need is right here in my community. Exactly. And having a deeper understanding of how to take care of what we've got and how to use what we have to make things better. And OK, so we have mesquite. What are we going to do with that? Rather than doing everything we can to cut, burn, and poison it, how can we work with it? And if we don't want it, how can we guide the soil in a direction that makes it less appealing for the mesquite to be there? 
it's it goes back to our what we learned in farming last week perspective is everything if something is your enemy then you have to fight it but if you understand that the problem is the solution then you can work with that you can relax you can soften your mind around it you can imagine okay you're here to help me what do i need to know and then you're just going to be amazed at the things that open up to you and the people that show up and the information that that you stumble across that helps you understand that thing that you need to understand a little bit better so that you can have more of what you want. Amen. Every day in every way. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's everything. And, and you have to be one of the first ones to be uncomfortable <laughs> and lean into the thing that you don't know. And, you know, I've, I had several farmers today asking me about how are you going to harvest? I'm like, I don't exactly know. (laughs) I'm like, we have an idea. We think we're going to do it the way that the hay grazer gets done, but we don't know exactly. And also the table I was sitting at, not any of them knew about the THC testing. Oh my gosh. I'm like, which labs are you using? And I'm like, I I don't know. When are we supposed to do that? I, and so I was like, hold on, let me get Kyle. And I'm looking around. I'm just like, get the agronomist over here. And Kyle is just like, yes, I will take care of it. I'm certified to do it. We'll come out and send it off. But there's just so much that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's upon you and it feels very uncomfortable. Yeah. But next year we won't feel as uncomfortable. We'll be more prepared. We will have armor on the soil. We will yes. have planted fall cover crops. We will plant directly into <laughs> said cover crops. Yes. We will not be plowing anymore. Like there's no. all these little things that, I mean, would we have plowed if we were doing this by ourselves? No. I don't know mm-hmm. that we would have, <laughs> but we were working with conventional farmers and our family who's like this is what we do yeah so this is what's going to happen and then once we get this pallet ready then y'all can do what you want with it yeah but we know now that that was not the right move and we won't make that move again yeah no worries so in the meantime we are looking for a crimper and a no-till seed drill lockhart and surrounding areas (laughs) (laughs) if there's a farm ferry out there Yes, we are looking. I would also like um, a foliar sprayer. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes, we do need a foliar sprayer, a crimper, <laughs> and a seed drill, a no-till seed drill. <sighs> oh, my oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, that's easy. Ta-da. Taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. I do. Well, too. sis, how have you felt um, manning the board? You sound like a professional. Well, thank you. I love you. I'm not sweating as much as I was earlier, so it's better. <laughs> it's going to well, be fun. I'm sitting in my car and I am sweating I right now. I know that you are. I know that you are because it is 90 degrees outside right now, folks, here in Lockhart, Texas on Wednesday, June 12th at 5.58 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. We almost covered a whole hour. I didn't know. And we didn't even about. have to ask someone to come in and save us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're not having to go to the principal's office afterwards. So I know, we're I'm winning. Feeling pretty good about that. All right. Oh well, my gosh. Hey, well, you can feel free to run the board all the time and just you know let me loose to. <laughs> all right. <laughs> do what sissy. I do. Well, I. Love How do you feel about that? You know, I feel good about that. Yeah, I think I can okay. do that. Yes. All Excellent. Right. All right. Well, I sure love you. Thanks for calling. Or actually, thanks for answering the phone when I called you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I will doing a farm tour tomorrow, and then I will hit the road and be back in Lockhart before the sun sets. All right. Well, I can't wait to see you. And you are listening to KLKTLP 107.9 Lockhart.
Connect with the Soil Sisters at txsoilsisters.co. Submit questions, guest or show ideas, and sponsorship inquiries. The Soil Sisters podcast was created and produced by Joanna Newding. Editing and sound design are in the capable hands of the PodConnects Podcast Network.